Welcome back everyone, CUBE coverage here at Cisco Live, day two. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, host of theCUBE, industry analyst, breaking down all the action. We've been here for three days, counting the preview day, and what a great change to see a platform focus unified across all of Cisco, building a bridge to the future, and our next guest was on stage for both keynotes, Jonathan Davidson, Executive Vice President, General Manager of Cisco Networking, core part of the business, good friend of theCUBE. Jonathan, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Well, big week. Thanks for having me here, it's yeah, a big yeah. week. One of the biggest and uh, really excited to talk the, about The it. bar is really high now, the story's <laughs> so good. Yeah, the sizzle, the steak better be good. Let's see, let's, this is a great event. I think you guys really nailed it. The, the, the 13 years of covering Cisco, watching him, you know, big company, really the most valuable company in the world, and then the way the world changed and grew with the internet, yeah. a lot's gone on and a lot's changing. And now it seems like we're at an inflection point for Cisco as a company. Not to move up the stack, everyone talks about that, but to have a platform, and your theme was unification, unified experiences, building a bridge, but the networking is powering everything. The connectivity is the core. Data and networking are the hottest areas that we're talking about on theCUBE at every event we go to, and that powers machine learning, cloud computing, the way we work. This is your wheelhouse. This is, well, you're in charge. I, well, I think, well, I think Cisco is, has always been the epic company for networking and now security and networking go together. Uh, you can't think of one without the other. And, and obviously we want to make sure we've got that simplified experience, but you, you talk about the sizzle, where's the steak? Um, you know, we, we were really careful to make sure that we actually had products that were out in the market already so that we could show proof points towards this unification. Uh, and we started hinting at it last year when we started talking about cloud monitoring for Catalyst. But we, we knew we wanted to talk about the broader platform. We knew that we wanted to talk about this broader Cisco networking cloud, but we held it, which was hard, for a whole year so that we could have more proof points showing people that, hey, we are going to simplify the experience for you, whether you're on-prem or whether you're in the cloud. And a lot of it came out of an organizational focus, too. It's tight right now. You got networking, you got the groups highly focused, and then everything else goes into this new group called, well, it's new, not a new group, it's, they renamed it um, OutShift which is yeah. the emerging right. technology. So I call that the test kitchen. <laughs> but they're working on new businesses. So you have yeah. the core businesses all platforming up, right. networking security, and then they can differentiate on their own. And then the other group, how does customers reacting to this kind of change? Because it's multi-year. Absolutely. And what's their response been? The, the response has, has been phenomenal. And we have met with a lot of customers, starting with our, our global customer advisory board. And we've gone from there to uh, to lots, we talk to lots of customers every single day and we've, we've been putting this message out there for, for months now and the feedback has been, okay, this is great. I want my team to meet with your team because I want us to align so that we can start moving aggressively with you. And that was exactly, exactly, we couldn't have hoped for anything, any better <laughs> feedback. And, and, and the reason for that is because if we go through and we drive this unified experience, but we get there, our customers aren't with us, there was no point in the journey. So we really want to make sure that we make this journey seamless, simple, and as easy as possible for them to, to move along I'd with like us. I'd like to explore that a little bit and sort of what's under the covers, because you're going from this sort of product mindset to a platform, yeah. you know, you, talk, you guys talked a lot about features to outcomes, okay. And we, we hear this, cross-cloud, multi-cloud, what I call super cloud, John and I call it super cloud, <laughs> but it has meaning, right? Yeah. It's not just multi-cloud, it's maybe what multi-cloud should have been. So what's the enabler there? My understanding is you're creating a consistent experience, you just said that, on-prem, within any cloud, across cloud, potentially out to the edge at some point in time. What's the enabler there that technically allows you to create that experience? Well, if there was one enabler, I would have waved what that magic those, wand What's a long time ago, uh, but it, it is a whole set of things. So for example, um, getting a consistent experience means that you have to have a consistent way of developing your products. You need a common UI UX framework. Uh, and so G2's team and my team and Liz's team, the engineering teams all came together and defined this. We have an internal name for it. I'm not going to share it with you because it's not relevant. And we're all, it's we got, cool though. we're all snapping to that framework. Uh -huh. uh, and we're product by product going and 
bringing that framework in so you can have consistency of experience across each and every single one of our platforms. And that was kind of step one. And we've been going at that for a couple of years and now. That's a software framework, right? That is a software UI UX framework. Okay. Exactly. So that's 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 number one. But then it's also how do your how do your customers perceive the platform. So we know SSO, we had five different SSOs, uh, so, but that's not really what our customers want. You need to have a single sign-on. I always like to joke, it's in the name, single sign-on. <laughs> Why do we need five? So getting, getting convergence around that is really important. So I log in once, I'm logged in everywhere. And guess what, even if I'm switching applications, it doesn't feel like I'm switching applications. Um, then it comes down to branding. Like we've made our branding very confusing over time. And we've been simplifying it, uh, but for example, like Catalyst SD-WAN, formerly known as Viptela. It's going to be Catalyst SD-WAN from now on. So there's Meraki SD-WAN, there's Catalyst SD-WAN. But we want to unify those experiences as well. So think of it, if you want really fancy, intent-driven SD-WAN, we have Catalyst SD-WAN. If you want a simple, simplified SD-WAN, you can do that. But if you want to do security with it, it's the exact same UI to add security to the Catalyst SD-WAN as it is to add it to the Meraki SD-WAN today, right now. And, and so it's a whole combination of all these things coming together and it's just great collaboration between the teams. I was commenting yesterday on our keynote wrap up and review um, that after sitting through the keynote, you and uh, G2 and Liz and Chuck kind of kicking it off, I kind of felt like that Steve Jobs video when he first took over Apple. <laughs> we have too many products, we're going to simplify, <laughs> we're going to go back to Chai at Day. Yeah. He's very famous on YouTube. Yeah. But that really was a, a, of a structural change where he went into Apple and said, we're just going to yeah. simplify and focus on our right. core. Right. That's what it feels like here. And even right. the announcements, it's got a little AWS vibe to a lot of flow of news, but product f excellence, yeah. but not a feature speed, even though you guys like that, as Chuck said. Yeah. It was very much Apple-esque vibe. And I mean that as a complimentary way in the sense that it seems like simplification. This is yeah. by design. Can you take us through how you think about that, what's going on internally? I'm sure, sure. pulling people through that change is a yeah. management task. What's your, take us through some of that experience. Well, if you go back to even, let's say 15 years ago, you know, we would, we would be happy if we built a feature, we won the deal, and they didn't deploy it. We're like, oh, it's great. They don't deploy it, that means they're not going to call us for support. Fantastic. You know, and, and, and but we literally, that like no one thinks that way anymore, no one talks that way anymore. That would be considered a waste of time, right? And, and, and what you have all equally amongst us is we all have the same amount of hours every day. And so how do we go and make sure <coughs> that we're actually building to our customer outcomes and start from that way in? And this is why we've, we've started with uh, the, what's working already, we've been using it for years on the Meraki side, is this double diamond development approach, right? Which is you go through and you make sure you start with the outcome the customer needs, and then you go through design and development process, and, and that could take three, six months for stuff you already know. We know how to do routing, but if you're going to build something unique or some new outcome that the customer wants, it still might take three to six months to figure out what that MVP is going to look like, what the experience is going to be, and then you start writing code. And then you actually go and trial it a few times, you build a few prototypes, you go back, see is this what you're trying to solve for, and then you actually go and build the product out. Um, and so it's a very iterative, but what happens is when you ship the product, it can be adopted that same day, versus shipping the product and then having to wait 12 months or 18 months until you get to real MVP. So we don't celebrate FCS, we celebrate adoption. Talk about the impact of networking, obviously it does affect the experience of people's whatever application they're using or workload that they're running yeah. or chips that they've bought in their, their devices. As networking got more complex and diverse with the internet, you mentioned that in your keynote, that the internet, people now use the internet for backing through old routing. I right. talked about it yesterday. What's, what should people know about right now that you guys are doing with networking that's different than just five years ago or a few years ago? Yeah, well there's, there's so much that's changed in the last five years. I mean, we have been looking to simplify the portfolio. We have been looking to get more consistency about how we approach our, our customers and, and their demands. And the, well, first of all, networking is exciting again. I'll just put it that way. And, and the reason why it's exciting is I think is one of the benefits, the silver linings of the pandemic is that everyone realized the criticality of infrastructure and they realize that this is something, hey, you have to invest in, or it will slow down my movement towards digitalization. And every business is a digital business. Pizza chains are digital businesses now. Now, 
their product is not internet. But if you don't have a great experience for your customers, it doesn't work. And you heard it directly from, from this morning talking about to the NFL's head of security, like football is not a Sunday event or a Monday event or a Thursday event. You need to have constant integration and collaboration and bringing your customers in all the time. And the only way to do that is through a compelling digital experience and that requires you to really go and focus on all of that infrastructure. And by the way, I liked her comments. She was great, but great interview by the way on stage. You did, did a good job. But her, the, what jumped out at me was that comment she said, physical and cyber security is completely converged right. for her. And I think that's a new normal. What's your reaction to that? What would you say to the folks watching that haven't gotten there yet, that that converged cyber and physical security, whether it's your device or your office or whatever? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not only physical and virtual coming together, I would say that when you look at that from a sustainability perspective as well, so the ability to look holistically about making the office somewhere where you want to go to <laughs> instead of somewhere where you have to go to, and also with what we're having with all of the power costs increasing so dramatically around the world, you know, moving to PoE-based lighting can save you up to 50% of your power costs, right? And so when you're rethinking about how you can build out your, your infrastructure in the office, you can create a better experience. You can base a more holistic experience. You can enable where you can actually, if you've been to a new office, if you're a traveling salesperson, how do I find the open office? And instead of wandering, around, <laughs> you know, the old days where you open the door, oh, close yeah. door, open the door, close <laughs> the door, right? It's, it's, it can be frustrating for all of these mobile offices and you, you need to create that seamless experience and, and that is what she was talking about. How do you embrace this yeah. and create the experiences, but make sure you also know that increases the attack threat surface. So I think she mentioned 2,500 plus screens in just one of the stadiums, and if any one of them get hacked, I mean, that would be a very bad day. <laughs> so networking's getting more exciting, and it's just going to get more exciting going forward. Yeah. You're talking about the double diamond approach, and the time it takes to get to MVP. Do you think AI will compress that time to MVP, yeah. have you started a, sort of applying it for that specific purpose? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple ways that, that AI could, could help. Well, first of all, if you look at the developer experience, so being able to go and get enhanced tooling that can, you put in the comment of what you want to do and it actually proposes the line of code that you need. And it's actually pretty accurate for uh, kind of non-C, non-C++ type of types of things. But uh, it's going to get better mm -hmm. over time, especially as these things grow. So the ability to, I've talked to a, I'll just say a top Fortune 50 company uh, and one of their engineering directors, and they said that their staff was 70% more productive over the past several months because of those, put in what you want, it proposes it, you hit return, and you get to go to the next line of what you're trying to accomplish, or it could even give you a whole set of code, not just one line. So, Engineering efficiency can go up, and that can increase velocity, mm. um, and hopefully decrease errors. And so that's that's one part of it. Uh, and then the products themselves, you know, as we move forward, we think you know, G2 was talking a lot about prompt-based interfaces. So visually, you want to be able to see what's happening across your infrastructure. But if you could ask something a question, and then kind of narrow things down, which switch has the most errors on it in my network today? Okay, here you go, here's, here's it. Okay, take me to that switch. What do you think the problem is with that switch, right? You could actually work through these types of scenarios where today, that would be a, a bit of a daunting task if you've got 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 switches, or even 20, right? It could be a daunting task. And you could probably get to the point, maybe you're even there today where you can prioritize the severity of those issues and, and, and triage. And so many opportunities, yeah. and so I think there, I think UI is here to this because I think some of us are visual learners. I'm more of a visual learner. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so I think being able to see things is always going to be important, but having that as an augmentation I think is going to help a lot. I love how you guys put networking plus security as kind of like the, the pillars. Uh, as we know, security is a data problem too. Not a lot of data conversations here. I mean, I know how it's, cl it's cleaner with security because it's tighter, I like that. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with it at all but we all know data is underlying both those yeah. categories. And then the, each group has differentiation on their products. Yeah. I love that's a platform feature. What's your view of the data? What's going on under the covers? Yeah. How are you thinking about data? Obviously AI is going to help. Um, how, should, how are customers thinking about how they leverage yeah. their data? 100%, so this is, this is a, just like it's a, it's a war for talent, 
right? Always. And, and you, if you have the best talent, you can usually build the best products. So we're always focused on making sure that we've got the best talent so that we can go and, and build the greatest products. What you just shared is it's also a data-oriented business. Networking is a data-oriented business. But if you look at simple uh, facts, like we block more attacks in a day than Google searches. Right, that's there's a pretty and, and this is a, a number that we've shared for years, right? And and, and those numbers tune that still model mind boggling. Up. Those, I mean that's yeah. a new product. You can tune that up for that's your sock assistant, is that this is this is actually through the open DNS uh, product umbrella okay, yep. and the ability to go and do that, but that's just one piece of it. There's yeah. a lot of other things that we're doing and blocking on a regular basis. You look at what Thousand is. Thousand Eyes is great at what it does because it consumes so much data from some of the, how else do you know what's happening in real time across BGP of the whole internet unless you are taking in multiple feeds from all over the world yeah. of the internet in real time and able to actually understand what's happening. So you can see that IP addresses or entire ASs are being are being ran, being stolen. So you can actually understand is that real, is that not real, you can send alerts. But then on top of that, now being able to feed an application level data into that view means that you can have more of a digital experience monitoring. Yeah. So AppD, the full stack observability, that is a data-driven business. You know, and that's just very nuanced. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to bring this up because what you said on day one on your keynote ties to exactly that point. It's very nuanced. I want to make sure we get it out on the camera. You said network at AI scale. I was thinking AI at scale. Well, why is AI in there? Oh, data scale. But what you're getting at there is the way the network is with thousand eyes and even just the breach numbers you tossed around yeah. is just as an example of many other data points. Yeah. There's so much data at scale. That's AI available. Yeah. So it's almost AI. That's, that's what you're talking about. AI at scale. Is that kind of what you mean? Network at AI scale means the network is scaled up, and now a new set of Circumstances is coming to the yeah. to the table. Yeah, so I think the AI opportunity. So there's two. I think there's two things there. One is we are helping uh, hyperscalers with the largest types of AI infrastructures to build out those infrastructures. So that's the physical infrastructure at AI. The second part of of that is around you need the data sets. And if you go back to Cisco's business model 20 years ago, we built a router or a switch. We kind of threw it over the wall someone would install it, Rack and then it, yep. we would never hear from that router again, the old prodigal son analogy. They only came back if something broke, uh, and they would call tech support, and we'd find out, oh, router, here's the configuration, here's how you fix it, and then... Nice business. They disappear <laughs> again. Uh, it, but what, what we really need to be able to do is we need to be able to get real-time data, and if, we can, if the customer's willing to share that real-time data with us, then we can do a whole host of amazing things. I can tell you when your optic is going to fail. Right? I can tell you that if those boxes are overheated, that the, the mean time to failure just actually decreased so that the box likelihood of failure is because you, you had a data center uh, cooling thing that went out and for some reason the box uh, didn't shut down like it was supposed to. And we can see that, we can know it, and we can let you know that hey, we should pay this kind of attention to these, to these platforms over time. Yeah. That's all data driven. And that's because you, you know what happened, you know what went, went wrong, and you can predict the probability of it happening and again, is right. that right? Well we can predict, yeah. like things fail. Yeah. Like hardware fails. We know what the MTBF is for every single component on every single device. Uh, we know which batch of silicon every single component went into. And so if there was a bad batch of 100 components, we know we, if they're telemetry connected, we know where they are, we know what they've done, and we can say, hey, that bad batch is, is running in this network, and we can replace it, or there's a 5% higher probability that that device will fail than a normal device. And what do you want to do about it, Mr. or Mrs. Customer? And is that AI or just good st statistics? That's, well, I think a lot of people get confused. Yeah. ML, stats, and AI pretty often. So I think everyone just calls all of that AI now, yeah, which yeah. if you want to have a wholly separate conversation about that, Semantic, I would be happy yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think everyone just calls it AI, which is not technically accurate, but yeah. we can argue about that or we okay, can just talk about so, what so it does. So let's call it AI. So my <laughs> follow-up question is you talked about earlier about being a visual learner. Yeah. And it seems to me that so AI is a visual learner as well, it yeah. will be. So the more, Absolutely. And, and networking is visual, the more of visual prompts in, in you can give to the AI to learn, yeah. I would think it's going to make it more powerful. Does that yeah. make sense and is that sort of in the plan? Or? The way I think about it is this, is I, um, these models, they love structured data and networks are nothing more than graphs. 
if you yeah. think about it from that perspective, like mapping out graphs. And if you're able to map out very large graph data models and then apply the right heuristics to each one of them, you can do amazing things with that. So the, and the neural network side is coming online it's, too. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing that we are going to be able to do. So this all requires data, and so having that data through a, lo a large number of our customers now enable us to see what's happening in real time. When they do, we actually can be a lot more proactive with helping them understand how to keep their networks up and running to the, to the highest potential of that infrastructure. Is there, a, is there a data corollary there in terms of like a graph database um, or a graph well, data corollary? Uh, well, I think I think we're I think we're looking at how all these things, uh -huh. these technologies can come together. I think yeah. is the is the uh, way to think about it. Foundational models are hot. Certainly, you guys have a lot of action there. One of the things that we talked about a lot with you in the past few Cube interviews you've been on is uh, chips, silicon. Yes, and oh, silicon, silicon and networking was another bullet you mentioned. Network at scale, AI scale, silicon yeah. and networking, and then uh, AI enabled networking and security solutions. Silicon. Big advantage for Cisco. Uh, we were there when you launched the initiative. How's yeah. it going? It, what's the update? Dave and I were speculating that you should be in the, the chip business, sell to other people, but... Uh, well, but I'm, well, you, well, we are. kind of are, already are, yeah, right? You announced are. that uh, in, in San Francisco, you and three, I went to that. Three and a half years, years ago. ago. Yeah. How's that going? Right. Give an Pre-COVID, right, as I said exactly. two years ago. Before we all had to <laughs> go home. COVID years. How about long COVID? <laughs> That's why I used to say I got long COVID. Yeah, right, so you guys announced that. We announced it three and a half years ago. It's going very well. Um, we certainly have a number of wins, predominantly amongst the hyperscaler space. Um, because really, when you think about it, if we take a piece of silicon, we put it on a system, we put software on it, we ship it, um, we're happy to, happy to have a business that way. But if customers want to go and take the silicon and put it on their own system, they build it themselves, you're kind of shifting the OPEX burden from us to them. And you have to be able to amortize that cost over n number of devices. And so hyperscalers, have a lot of devices, and so they're very willing to go down that path of, of building. Some of them are, not all of them. Now, that flexibility of, take it your way, how would you like your burger, um, has gone over very well with customers. Even customers who don't want to go down that path, the fact that they know that they can buy silicon from us, systems with no software, software with no systems, put it on a white box, it makes us very open, and I think that that three and a half years ago is very good. The one data point I will share with you, we launched one chip three and a half years ago, and traditionally what we've seen in this market is people are putting out a new chip every 18 to 24 months, some even slower than that. Um, in the last three and a half years, we now have 14 chips in that family. So our pace of innovation is yeah, yeah. unparalleled in the industry, and we continue to push very aggressively to get higher, faster speeds, and actually go down market with those it's chips as well. It's all the actions of the physics right now, the physics is key, the physical layer. Reminds me of the old OSI model, Dave. Remember the old OSI model? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nailed the physical, kind of getting into the stack there. Uh, you guys are doing great work. Props to you guys. Final question I have, and then we got to maybe look at breaking, and maybe Dave get one more for you in. Is you said, um, if it's connected, it's protected. Okay, nice, nice tagline. Talk about security. Is Cisco a security company? I mean, I tweeted this morning, it's not about point solutions, because that's kind of what you were kind of yeah. saying today. Security's embedded, NFL's yeah. relying on you. Um, it's a huge market by the category we were yeah. riffing today. Security, a big part of Cisco. Explain, take a minute explain, what is the position of the security yeah. market does Cisco play in? Yeah. Is it embedded in other devices? Is it standalone, point solution, platform? Yeah. Well, uh, the way I like to think about it is this. So we are absolutely a security player. Security is, as we have said and Chuck has said, is our highest priority. Like we, we need to make sure that our customers feel like we are doing and building phenomenal products in the security space. And I think G2 and Tom and Raj and team have been doing an absolutely phenomenal job. Now there's different markets and I don't want to overcomplicate everything. So if somebody wants a firewall, we want to win that business. We want to have the absolute best, and we, we do have the absolute best firewall in the market. Um, if somebody wants an outcome, hey, help me with my branch. You need connectivity, you need security, you might need cameras, you need SD-WAN, you need all these things. Hey, we want to help you with that outcome. But if somebody wants a switch, we're going to have the best darn switch in the entire world, right. and we want you to buy our switch. So we don't want to overcomplicate if somebody's, because this could be a switch, and then we're just like, well, let's talk about what outcomes you want with that switch. It's like, if they want a switch, we're going to sell you a switch. But if they're going, hey, 
I have a challenge here with my branch office or I'm trying to re-envision what this campus looks like on Fifth Avenue in New York, hey, let's reimagine together and we have all the pieces that you need to have a delightful outcome for the users inside of your business. Final word, and bring us home with the interview. What's, what do you want people to walk away with this week? What's your, from your perspective, your keynote, what's the bumper sticker, what's the core message? All right, so a few, all right, ready? I yeah, got about go. 20 Fire minutes. Away. All right, so. Uh, <laughs> 30 so seconds. Unified experiences <laughs> are critically important. Security and networking are, are coming together like no one else on the planet can do. And top of that, you've got observability, where we have more data than anyone else on the planet, and we are able to help you understand what's happening across your infrastructure better than anyone else. And if you haven't taken a look at our, our full stack observability with Thousand Eyes and AppD, you truly, truly, truly are missing yeah. out. Thousand Eyes looking good. I love the data story. John, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Appreciate your, your time. I know you're super busy with customers. It's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Tough. Thank you, come on. Okay, so CUBE coverage, day two. Here at Cisco Live in Las Vegas, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, analyzing all the action, bringing it to you no matter what. This is our pop-up cube. We're happy to be here. We'll be right back with more after this short break.